I think I'm going to hide myself. If I can, I. I'll trim this bit from the recording. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Rory, get your stuff you can do with me. Not sure I'm hiding with um, the admin view. Uh, I can probably hide Rory. you, you just want your camera. Oh, yeah, yeah, hide me. <laughs> Oh yeah, stop my video. I can mute myself. Is it, the recording going to be like just my name across the screen? Is that going to look weird? Uh, it'll uh, once, yeah, so now I've started talking. Um, I'll be on the main bit of the screen, so that'll flick as to whoever's speaking. Um, and then Phil's got a screen share, so that'll pop up as well. Uh, but when we get the recording, we'll just trim it all up to when we say go. Well, we're good with that now, aren't we? We are. <laughs> we can trim videos. <laughs> I'm now getting that nobody's going to turn up feeling. But they've, a lot of them have booked on very recently. So here we go. Ah, so um, attendees uh, just starting to come through. So we're just going to give it um, a couple of minutes to give everybody a chance to get on. And then uh, we'll make a start in just a few moments, just give people a chance to get logged on. I appreciate we're all in, in very busy times. So, so we, uh, we're happy to just wait a couple of minutes um, and get started. Okay, so I will start doing um, some introductions um, and let you know a little bit about what we've got coming up. And then as and when people join, um, they'll just be able to, to pick up from where we're at. Uh, so my name's Elena Rawcock. I'm a director and the co-founder of Elevate Greater Manchester, which is a business development consultancy. We've worked really closely with Bruntwood Works um, since we launched back in September last year. And one of the things that, that we've loved about working with Bruntwood Works is they really take responsibility for their place within the community. And that's something that we're going to come on to in terms of you know, sustainability as we go through this. Um, but it's also in terms of ways that they can support their, their customers and, and their suppliers. And that's really where the, the Bruntwood Spark programme um, has come from. That as well as doing all of those things about kind of looking at, at their position as, as a landlord in the situation, um, as we all kind of lived through the, the chaos that was 2020, and is, is sadly continuing into this year that they realised they had some incredible customers with a whole wealth of knowledge and experience and also a whole load of customers who would really benefit from that. So they run advisor sessions, workshops, webinars, um, and something called the Peer Networks Programme, which really helps to amplify their customers' voices and give expertise on knowledge on a whole range of topics from how to set up e-commerce platforms, creating happy teams, being COVID secure, moving to online work, pretty much anything that you can think of um, that's valuable to businesses has been covered through the Bruntwood Works um, Spark programme. And it's something that, that my business partner, Katie, and I have been, been really proud to be involved in. The Peer Networks programme that I mentioned um, is something that we run as Bruntwood Works' delivery partner um, that's funded through the Business Growth Hub and Bays. 
And what that program does is to bring together um, SMEs within Greater Manchester in small groups to talk about the challenges that they're facing, problems that they're having within the business, and really become a, a tight unit to offer support to each other. And just off the back of the first few meetings that we've had there, some, some real key themes have come out of it that were useful to discuss within those groups, um, but we felt, and Bruntwood Works felt, really would benefit from having um, some more kind of webinars, bringing in some guest speakers and talking through those themes. And that's where this series of Lunch and Learn webinars has come from. So we're kicking off today talking about net zero. Next week, we're going to talk about the future of the workplace. And we're also going to cover online marketing, creating happy teams. How do we open back up safely? So do go on to Bruntwood Works' website um, and have a look at that Spark programme um, and get yourself booked on um, to any that of interest. We're also going to record the sessions and be sharing those out afterwards. We appreciate um, schedules are a little bit crazier than they've ever been before. So one of the things um, that we're really passionate about um, at Elevate Greater Manchester is sustainability. Um, I've had the pleasure of sitting on the GM City Green Comms Board um, for some time, and I sit on that with Phil Corbell, who is our guest speaker today. And he's the founder of the Carbon Literacy Project. And what really attracted um, me to that as a, as a project and as a, a training scheme is that it's not just let's chat about net zero and let's talk about all these things. It's, it's very much action based. It's It's got a pledge format to it so we can start to quantify um, the impact that getting people through those training courses have. And I was really excited um, as part of setting up Elevate GM to be able to start training courses on carbon literacy. And even more exciting um, that as of last week, Elevate GM has become the world's first carbon literate business development organisation. So I've invited um, Phil here today to talk through some of the, the basics around climate change, what our impact is, what we can be doing as individuals and businesses to really kind of address that crisis. Uh, I get that like, it can be um, a pretty disheartening topic at times and, and we're determined to make sure that what you leave with is, is a sense that there is some kind of you know, positive action there and, and things that you can do. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Phil um, to give us a brief introduction um, and then he's also got um, a presentation that we'll share before we move into the Q&A section. Thanks, Alona. Uh, really good to be here. Um, where to start? Okay, before, th there'll be slides. Okay, sorry, there'll be slides. Uh, but um, uh, I suppose me, um, I've been in our marvellous city for a long time. I'm just doing the, yeah, goodness, it's 40, it's going to be 40 years soon. So I've got my naturalisation papers at last. Um, and uh, after having worked at the BBC, um, making documentaries for Radio 4 and the like, um, I then uh, set up a charity, Radio Regen, to set up community radio stations, um, not for the sake of playing records in sheds, as Mark Radcliffe once, sometimes, once put it. It was uh, much more about how do you put these amazing uh, community assets at the service of communities, particularly disadvantaged communities. So learning to love places like uh, Harper Hay and Withenshaw uh, was an extraordinary uh, opportunity for, for growth and discovery for me uh, and it broadened my perspective on what sustainable development's about as in you have to bring people along with you and make sure that their priorities and needs are met in the mix of this whole environmental stuff as well um, and uh, oh yeah before that I, I cycled a tandem back from Sydney that's a much much longer story which I won't delay you with now you'll be glad to hear um, but um, I set up um, Cooler Projects uh, as a community interest company uh, with my co-founder Dave Coleman in 2007-8 as a way of sort of bridging the gap between the big commercial consultants and the campaign groups, proper social enterprise stuff, and that rapidly migrated into uh, setting up the Carbon Literacy Project, and it's absolutely about putting my skills and experience at the service of uh, the future well-being of my children. That's a phrase we tripped over was, I want to leave my children a, a future, not an apology. Um, and uh, that's very much what this is all about. 
Um, so what I'm going to do in this brief presentation is, um, uh, I suppose it's a bit of a provocation leading up to a plug. Sorry, <laughs> you've got to have the plug as part of it. But um, yeah, I'll be slightly provocative, uh, hopefully stimulate some thinking and some dialogue later and, and we can take uh, questions um, uh, when I'm done uh, via the chat function, as I understand. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to do that thing where everything goes wrong and I attempt to, to share screen. So bear with me for a minute while we attempt this. Um, and uh, see, um, uh, Elena, you're going to nod and say that's going. Great, that, that's, that's us. Oh yeah, uh, Twitter handle bottom right. Um, please feel free to make any comment you like about what's going to happen. So my board. Um, uh, and th yeah, good. This is the bit where the slide does not progress because, and I've so had this before, this proves it's live and that we're authentic and real people. I'm going to have to duck out of my sharing for a minute. Sorry about this, folks. I mean, you can relate to this. I know. I know exactly what's happened. That I've tried to go just the, the joys of, of the world yep. we're in at the moment. It's Don't a, worry is, about but it. But I, I know all. what's happening. I will have a solution with you in no time at all, he said with the you know, most blithe confidence. Absolutely no problem. We're... For the people who are watching us, we do have that, that chat function in Q&A. So if at any point during the presentation you do have questions, just pop them in there um, and I'll pick up on them in the Q&A after. Hopefully this is all going to work for Okay, that that's what it's all about here. That's great. Okay, so with any luck, this is my board, um, my girls, uh, quite a long time ago. Uh, this is who I'm answering to. Um, um, eldest, actually, this is 2019, the school strikes, uh, climate change, a safeguarding issue. So I'll be reporting back to them. One thing that carbon literacy doesn't do a lot of is training, but we did end up training some senior public officials like uh, this guy, uh, who is a senior police officer. Now, we'd start these sessions um, always by saying what's this got to do with your job so we'd start a question you know what what happens to your work when it gets hotter and this senior police officer said yeah we get more trouble we get more um theft we get more violence okay that that's that's banter isn't it he said no no we've got the data all right if you've got the data what temperature does this come in at he said 18 degrees it was one of those moments where the room went Oh, really? Yep, got the data. We we have more trouble uh, over 18 degrees. And yeah, that rapidly came home to the whole group. So from a, a non-expert who got the picture to an expert, um, he, this is one of my climate heroes. Um, he's a, a local academic, uh, Kevin Anderson. Um, if you want the unvarnished truth from a uh, climate scientist, with no attempt at cushioning the blow. Look up Kevin's stuff on YouTube uh, if you've got a reserve of optimism to be eroded. Um, but he says this, a four degrees centigrade uh, future is incompatible with an organized global community. Um, just think about some of the disruption we've been facing uh, since the, the virus took hold. Uh, really, and you just see that with more extreme weather, dot, 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 you know, he's, he's not wrong. We have to avoid this. But this is a big problem. You know, it, it's so hard to imagine what unfettered global heating, a climate crisis, a, an ongoing barrage of extreme weather would do to us. But people say this. And I think that, that's, that's quite fair. Think about it. Yep, it's an environment, whatever route came that brought this about, it's an, it came from an environmental cause, from us messing around with the environment. It's definitely, yeah, big time. It also was absolutely predicted by science. Are you getting the parallels now? Um, and similarly, predicted by science, ignored by politicians, um, and like the climate crisis, might have a big price tag to prevent it, but we're getting a sense of what a great investment that would have been. Also, in terms of equity and justice, those least responsible are being hit the hardest, the least able to cope with the consequences of the crisis are being hit. And we mustn't forget this, as a parent, 
particularly. This is appalling, and this is going to be one of the, the hardest legacies of the whole crisis. But it gave us pause for thought and reconnect with some of the things that might be important to us. And perhaps finally, um, we all have to get on board that sense of the the sheer need for collaborative action, rapid collaborative action is brought home to us. So a lot to think about in those parallels between the pandemic and the climate crisis. But let me put um, a statement to you, as I say, by way of provocation. Really, I, I'd love to test that proposition. Yep. If a business professional is not able to express the relevance of the climate crisis in their workplace, to their customers, to their clients, it's almost like going into any uh, form of business, one-legged, you know, you've got a hand, two hands tied behind your back. I really believe that there is no area of commerce without climate change risk, but it's not just risk at all. There's opportunity in the inaction, in getting your act together. Um, not knowing this audience, um, you might be thinking, well, I've got this opinion about climate change. Well, hey, guess what? Your opinion on this is really, really irrelevant. Um, you could think it's all a conspiracy, heaven forbid, but you might. But regardless, guess what? Yeah, your client is going to have a, car a, a carbon footprint and you are part of that footprint. Um, so this comes down the supply chain. The big companies are on this. They're measuring their carbon footprint and you will probably be part of that footprint and be asked to measure it. And yeah, if you're customer facing, th this is so, so true. Um, I think it was last week, there was a mega survey, global survey that showed attitudes on, on getting the urgency of action on climate change through the roof. Last year, uh, this is a great charity. We do some work with Climate Outreach. Uh, they're a climate communication charity. They did a, a huge survey themselves that, again, just saw concern right across age ranges, right across backgrounds. Um, and uh, it is way up there in people's minds. So a quick branch off into this. Um, no prizes. Sorry, we're going to play acronym bingo for a minute. But this is the... Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, possibly the largest ever collective scientific endeavour, yeah, where all the science, the published science on climate change was sucked in together and the world scientists went into work. I just sort of like that. <laughs> I just sort of like that image. But you, you don't mess with peer-reviewed science, yeah? I, scientists love to argue you know, they score points off each other by disproving each other. And like this IPCC process is turbocharged peer review. It knocks off all the corners, the, 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 the outriders it is brought in. So it's inherently small C conservative. So when in their landmark report in 2018, um, they said, right, our global target needs to restrain global heating to within 1.5 degrees of the pre-industrial norm. Uh, given that we're pretty much at one degrees, you the, you get how very, very ambitious that is. Um, it's not a case of option A, B, C or D. It's all of them and doing it now. This is a fairly accurate summary, however colloquial. Um, yep, we've just got to get on with it and get on with it fast. Um, so when people ask me, uh, is this the right thing to do? Inevitably, uh, yeah, probably. Um, and can we do it at large scale and do it fast? Yeah, those are the thing, the, the key elements of the big solutions around this. And please, please don't ignore behavior change. I'm not just saying that, it's common sense. We need people on board. We've seen the outbreak of, uh, let's be polite, say delusion over COVID uh, of uh, a vocal minority saying, no, it's not happening, it's irrelevant, scientists are wrong. Uh, see that magnified on um, as a barrier to climate action. We need the great, great bulk of us on board. So what's happening? Yep. When was that? That was November. Who'd have thought? I mean, this this is huge ambition 
coming from a conservative government, not traditionally seen on board with this agenda. Um, and then, of course, the huge event in the state. And this, again, not forgetting, those two guys are not left-wing radicals. I mean, they might be in comparison to the, the previous incumbent, but John Kerry and Joe Biden are driving this at a pace that even uh, environmentalist uh, campaigners are going, wow, okay, this is good. In the corporate world, I won't dwell on this. You know, I mean, these guys are on it. They really, really are. Uh, the, oh, the, the, the former chief executive of uh, Amazon, as I can say today, keeping bang up to date. So he's announced this Earth Fund. Do you remember how much that was for? <laughs> Eye-watering amounts of money going into climate solutions. Uh, so he's put 10 billion and he's he's spending the just the first round of that fund has put $700 million into play. <laughs> this just made me laugh at the scale of it. One of the things he's funding is a blooming satellite, a generic satellite picture, but he, he's put $100 million into putting a, a, a climate measuring satellite of some sort. I'm scrabbling around for its precise detail there into orbit. So this is so mainstream, resources are piling into it um, and we've got to be on board. So stand by, this is the plug, um, my bit, yep. Um, we have to mobilize to try to do this as a niche specialism is um, just it's just goes against common sense doesn't it so uh, our training scheme because that's what we enable it, it sort of sets up a foundation of getting your people on board it's a learning and doing framework so it's not just learning about uh, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases it's absolutely about what do we do and how do we do it uh, crucially, we don't do it, you do, yep. Um, you devise or access a course and deliver it. Um, and it works top down and bottom up. You talk to the big organizations that have worked with us, you get the senior management on board, you get your enthusiasts on board and things start to really happen. It starts to fizz and it works alongside other training. Um, in organizations that have trained in carbon literacy across the board, it simply comes in, in induction. You do your safeguarding, data protection, and carbon literacy, health and safety, whatever, and it's just in there as part of a norm uh, along the core workplace competencies. That's us in numbers. I won't dwell on that. I think we're up to about 16 and a half thousand people uh, certified. And bottom right, that's a guesstimate on energy saving. Uh, via Jacobs Engineering, so quite authoritative, although we've not, it is a guesstimate. Some of the people we're working with, I can tell you more about this. Uh, local, great, our first FTSE 100 uh, company. Uh, they want to be a very good employer. They want to be a purposeful employer, as well as uh, driving up the uptake of electric vehicles, changing their market as it goes. Uh, also local, now recently just uh, moved into Stockport, um, BASF have a huge uh, footprint and a very, very ambitious science-based target to reach it. Um, also over in uh, Media City, um, BBC are very much involved and Coronation Street were actually the first carbon literate um, TV production company. Uh, and they've worked across a consortium with these guys to make things happen. So a consortium approach is also possible and that's the quickest ever sketch. Um, We'll have questions in a minute, but I love this cartoon. It just, it's not just about the environment. Virtually all climate action brings in substantial uh, other co-benefits as well. And this should drive us even faster to get on with this. And that's me, if you need to get in touch. I think that'll do, round of applause. <laughs> That'll do. Um, yeah, a, a sketch and a little bit provocative. So uh, forgive me about that. Wonderful. That's that's so useful, Phil. I've obviously seen seen some of that before, but every time I watch it, I do genuinely get like a little bit inspired again. Yeah. It's that that extra like little um, kick of motivation. So the chat function um, is open, and I'll keep an eye on that. So if anyone's got any kind of specific questions and um, that you want to ask, or, or kind of anything you'd want some more information on, then do just um, pop it in the chat. One of the things that, that I'm really struck by when I see that is 
the range of organisations um, that are involved and their kind of different reasons for doing it, because I think up until quite recently, we kind of saw it as being like, it's a bit hippie. It's this, you know, these, these crazy environmentalists and you had poor people like David Attenborough who are like, I've been telling you this for 50 years now, like it's time to pay attention. Um, but we do seem in the last couple of years to have like this real change that actually sustainability is becoming mainstream. You know, we've got big brands talking about it. Um, and it's not just people who, who want to be green or who have, you know, this kind of real environmental passion that are getting behind it. So it might, could you run through a few of the, the reasons that people have either got behind carbon literacy training or have, have implemented some of those kind of large-scale projects that you talked about let's blur the boundaries between uh, carbon literacy is one route to climate action obviously a brilliant one that everyone should take up uh, our favorite but, obviously <laughs> <laughs> no so what when lockdown hit uh we're an organization that depends on training revenue on people being in a room uh to get trained uh, i really i thought we were done for um really did i thought that would be it the phone kept ringing in spite of the pandemic, the interest across the board has, has kept on up. I just gave a few examples of how mainstream this is. Um, there's a, um, a renewables 100 index of the big companies going for 100% renewables. They're all up there, the, the, the large corporates. Um, and some in the SME end of things as well. Um, either out of conviction or out of uh, supply chain pressure um, or, or sensing there's a niche, a uh, brand niche in this. So uh, going back on this, okay, reasons to get on board. Um, overheads um, a, a, and a company taking action on climate is most likely to be running more leanly. We're looking at waste, particularly energy waste, uh, logistics, travel, you have to go lean if you're acting on, on climate. So there's, again, this is what I mean by what you think about this is pretty irrelevant. It, it, it just makes commercial sense. Why are you spending more on your overheads than you need to? Um, some big companies um, might seem a little bit counterintuitive on this, not known for their environmental track records, but want to attract uh, the best talent particularly young talent. Uh, and I think it's taken for granted now that uh, millennials want to work for a purposeful employer. And it's a, and certainly uh, doing your bit on climate in a tangible way, which could be expressed through carbon literacy is, is one aspect of it. So one company we work with really put serious resources and intent behind diversity and access agenda. Um, they'd really sort of peaked on that. They felt they'd done all they could on that within reason, where would they go to next? Well, the, a whole bunch of their staff went, yeah, climate. And they came to us on that basis. So it's responding to staff needs as well. There's a little bit about being a human being, I'd like to think. <laughs> However, it's such a, a personal issue, isn't it? Because yeah. I think it's, regardless of, of where you sit, it's, it's going to have that that co-benefit. And I think like that cartoon you show at the end, like it's it's such a great sketch because it's kind of like, you know, all these people are like, you know, it might be a hoax. And it's like, well, even if it was and we did all of these things, like, would that be a bad thing? Um, and a lot of the reasons that, you know, we've had it, it raised to us from all kinds of different companies is it's generally come from something that isn't the core activity of the business. So it's either, like you say, it's uh, needing to reduce overheads and, you know, obviously budgets are, are particularly tight coming out of the last year. So, you know, if there's something we can do, like we probably want to look at it or it's, you know, that talent market, you know, we, we all know there's a, there's a massive tech skill shortage, you know, across Greater Manchester. So if you've got the choice of where to work, why wouldn't you go somewhere that, that's more sustainable? Um, and also kind of seeing that that consumer power as well, I think has been, been quite a change that people are potentially, you know, they want to be seen as sustainable, they want to buy into those brands. What's your kind of view on that kind of you know, sustainable consumer angle? We know it's big news. Um, if you look at that climate outreach survey, um, the scale of uh, concern uh, is huge. We're, we're talking in the 60 to 70 percent uh, cross segment uh, registering this as a substantial concern. So uh, in business as a distinguishing mark, 
uh, we're doing this, we're walking the walk on this. And note, uh, you've got to get, get past the cynicism barrier as well. We were very sensitive to greenwash too. So doing it, doing it right um, is going to attract a good segment of the public. Now, obviously, yeah, it depends which, which element of the public you're looking at. But it, it's not to supplant your core performance and your core service or, or, or goods you're providing. I think it's really interesting in this work we're doing with the automotive sector. Um, Tesla don't sell their cars uh, as in a great environment thing. They sell their cars because they're good, high performance, high prestige cars, uh, which, man which motoring in their survey of best cars this year, their second highest car across categories of all cars is a Kia, I think, a, a Kia uh, fully electric because it's one of the best cars, not because it's one of the best electric cars. Now, you know, so uh, it, it's, it's more than a nice to have, much more than that, but it should not divert you from excellence and competitiveness in what you're doing as a business. And I think it fits really, really well together. Uh, back to this being personal. Why would you be in business to erode the safe future of our children if you could avoid it and avoid it in ways that make sense for your business? It, it becomes a no brainer. Uh, and as, like I say, um, mainstream. So, so mainstream. Someone else that pops up in my presentations is the former governor of the Bank of England, that well-known left-wing radical, Mark Carney. You know, it's so, so mainstream. Now, he's not doing it necessarily as an environmentalist, whatever that is. He's doing it because he foresees a massive risk to the financial markets in the, the carbon asset bubble when the bottom falls out of the price of fossil fuels. And the disruption we really are at that kind of risk opportunity place with the economy Absolutely. that you know Absolutely. the economy is is not in a good place at all and there's you know there's clearly that kind of feeling of you know we can't be doing anything that costs money at the moment like what do we need to do uh, but actually that means we have to be so much more sensitive to risk so if we're investing in in industries and organizations that that haven't considered the climate impact that becomes much riskier but also there's this incredible opportunity and we, we've seen it with um the 10 point plan that came out last year that they're talking about job creation and they're talking about getting the UK to be the industry leader we hear it a lot here in Greater Manchester about you know we want to be first you know we want Greater Manchester to get to net zero kind of 2038 that we see that investment as an opportunity and a competitive advantage and we probably need that now more than ever yeah yeah uh, uh, and it, it's uh, like I say it's not an either or smart investors will be looking for uh, good performance on indicators on that mark as well. Uh, we're just starting work uh, with uh, an investment house, going to, a Manchester-based investment house, who are going to be the world's first carbon literate investment house. Uh, and they've already got a really strong uh, emphasis on environmental and social goals. And they're using carbon literacy to build the capacity of their portfolio to act uh, better on this issue. So, you know, how many drivers do you need to get on board with the agenda? You know, so it, it's um, it's just seen. And, and this uh, thing from investors is going right across the board. Um, investors, large scale investors are dumping fossil fuels, polluters. Like really so we good. have um, a question from one of our um, attendees here. So Rachel's on the Manchester Food Board um, and she'd be interested in knowing what your opinion is on the future of sustainable consumption from a food point of view. So thinking about hospitality, food, retail, supermarkets and what can we do as, as consumers and as businesses to encourage more sustainable food businesses? Well, from the food supplier's point of view, going back to my, my point about keeping it great, keep providing tasty food, the best, you know. Um, uh, one of my rallying calls for this is, is the Co-op's Incredible Burger. It's a vegan pea-based protein burger that tastes gorgeous. As a, as a, uh, I still remember my carnivore days. I only went vegetarian quite recently. And uh, um, it's a great burger that is also... You know doing great work you know it, it also does great stuff on the environment side so uh, breaking that down um supermarkets 
are by and large on board with this. The big supermarkets will have science-based targets that they'll be driving into the supply chain, ready or not, yeah? Um, so if you're in the supply chain for supermarkets, you will have to be answering on your footprint. And this will be much, much easier if you've mobilized your people. Um, you don't have to rely on external specialists to do footprint measuring, depending on the measure, yeah? Um, in hospitality, uh, I don't just, just increase your range. You're going to find out, you know, drop vegetarian, you know, put more vegetarian and vegan items on the menu and see how it goes. You're not stuck with it. It's a menu, isn't it? You know, um, see how popular it gets and, and work with your customers to broaden their tastes as well. You know? Um, just so, Absolutely. and we're seeing some like great PR uh, around some of those things. So things like you know, who didn't see the Greg's vegan sausage roll? Uh, like the what they got from that and the revenue that it built. You know, a few years ago, who would have thought? You know, that that's where Greg's would go on it. And then it kind of right at the other end of the market, um, we see where the light gets in at Stockport. They get you know a green star from Michelin. It's like this idea that you know being sustainable is you know I was vegetarian um, as a teenager and essentially like you got a vegetarian lasagna and a nut roast and, and that was pretty yes. much your lot if you were lucky. I remember being on holiday in France and literally just been given a, a plate of vegetables because they just not do vegetarianism um, and having been kind of vegan-ish um, for the last few years. Like the range of stuff that's out there um, is incredible and like you say it's about putting that kind of that that taste first that you know I know that I can cook you know lovely food from scratch at home but I can also you know I can now grab things from a service station if we're going somewhere which even a couple of years ago like you would really struggle with I can go to nice restaurants I can have that whole kind of hospitality experience at any level and I'm doing it you know partly because I want a more sustainable diet partly because I want you know the health benefits of it but I don't feel like I'm sacrificing um, anything by doing that which is is a massive change and you know particularly places like Manchester are seeing a, a real increase in that which is you know presumably driven as much by the consumer as, as anything else. I think um, Sam Buckley at uh, Where the Light Gets In exemplifies this. His mission is extraordinary food and he, he delivers on that. It's not a vegetarian restaurant. Um, he, he exemplifies environmental sustainability through the whole of what he does. If you ever get a chance to see him talk about this, it's brilliant. Um, it's about eating the whole pig. I'm sure, <laughs> pro probably literally, <laughs> if I know Sam, you know, uh, uh, and, and making sure there's no waste and, and, and experimenting and giving a buzz to this exploration of the agenda. And I'm sure that can be replicated in, in any field. Um, but the fact that vegetarian and vegan food can taste absolutely fantastic. Uh, is brilliant. Um, and perhaps not to be too partisan about it, like Sam does, you know, um, he's, he's maximizing his environmental performance across the board with, um, uh, within the parameters of using the broadest range of locally sourced excellent uh, ingredients. That move to local is really key as well, isn't it? That it's not just about like what you eat, it's, it's about where it comes from. So, you know, if you're a vegan, but what you're eating is, is highly processed air freighted foods, that, that's going to have a very different impact on what we're doing. And I think something that, that we've seen quite a lot of over the last year is that kind of move back to almost kind of being, you know, hyper local that we have, you know, you're struggling, you know, you can't get a fruit and veg box delivered, you know, for love nor money, because there was suddenly this influx in people who wanted to go down that route because we couldn't necessarily get to the supermarkets or get those kind of online slots that it, it made us review some of our shop habits and um, I've recently signed up with the Modern Milkman who are you know, a fantastic tech company um, that have moved into Manchester we've got a huge amount of investment behind them but actually what it makes me feel like is that I'm living in the 1950s because I now open my door in the morning and there's my bottled oat milk sitting on my doorstep and I send my bottles back and it's that driver again for sustainability and it comes back to one of the points you made in your presentation that's like we've got the technology we need, we just kind of need to get on and do it. That you know, as much as it's brilliant that, you know, we have Amazon putting satellites into the sky and, and that absolutely plays its part. Some of the stuff is, is just getting back to, you know, we lived sustainably not that long ago because we didn't have a choice. So actually sometimes it's about kind of going back to, you know, more traditional ways of doing things, shopping local, not wasting, using everything that you buy rather than, you know, investing in, in the shiny, exciting tech side of things. 
this can cut through to the absolute fundamentals of what drives us. Um, and I think the pandemic has forced a stop for thought on that, uh, at the importance of, of the basics of health, shelter, food, uh, but also the importance of relationships and perhaps how little of that uh, need be connected to excessive consumption, buying things you don't need that you can't afford. Um, so th there's some interesting, interesting uh, challenge points for some aspects of business around sustainable provision um, and what we value a and turning that into revenue, of course, uh, from a business perspective in an ethical and sustainable way. Uh, it, it's all out there and it's been brought into, into sharp focus, what we really mean by sustainable development. There's an interesting thing that comes up time and time again in environmental circles about ah, individual change, it's nothing we need, system change, system change. Um, it's not a contradiction. Part of what we're doing with carbon literacy is trying to induce a, a mainstream low carbon culture. Yeah, so get people placing a greater value on low carbon goods and services, acting in a more uh, climate friendly way, but also supporting climate friendly um, initiatives as well. So, you know, so I think the link between individual change and big, cha big system change, and that can be individual company change, um, is, is absolutely vital. Um, one needs the other. If it's just people swapping out their light bulbs, and yet we're, we're still, you know, fueling those, th that electricity with coal, you see, you know, it, it's got to have both. It's that balance, isn't it? Of we can't get overwhelmed and kind of look at it and go like, I can't possibly do anything because there's too much, but also not letting ourselves off the hook too easily and being like, oh, well, you know, I had a corn burger yesterday, so so I'm good now. It's like, it's getting that balance of, of the level of significance. But, but what it, are some of the key things that, that a business can do? So obviously we've got people who will be, be watching this live or, or following on from kind of, you know, all different kind of sectors. Are there any kind of key focus points that you would suggest people, you know, take back to their business and you know, they might not know where they're at at the moment? What are the kind of areas that they might want to have a bit of an investigate and see if they can improve? The big ticket numbers for, I'm going to have to be horribly generalistic here, energy supply, if you have control of, of your energy supply, um, if you haven't investigated switching to a genuinely green tariff, um, do so. You'd be really surprised if it's not matching your current tariff. I'd be really, really surprised. It's so much in the zone there. It's probably one of the biggest things you can do. If you have uh, a lot of travel and transport in the organisation, yep. Uh, look at that. Obviously, that that's changed beyond recognition, probably since March. Um, supply chain, if you have influence on supply chain, start putting environmental, particularly carbon criteria into your supply chain. Um, but stay excellent at what you do. You know, this is what I mean. You, you don't have to, to fundamentally change what you do. And if suddenly you're diminishing the, the quality of what you do in the name of, of climate, you're not going to have a business. Then again, if you're trashing the climate to make a fast book, how do you sleep? You know, so there's a bit of a balance in that it as is. well. And I think it's it's a short term decision to do something that that's damaging to the environment because we know that that's not a long term business model either because the resources that you're exploiting simply aren't going to be there, or your customers, your supply chain, your staff aren't aren't going to want to get involved. And um, have you got any examples of kind of local businesses who've, who've been at kind of a, a bit of the sharp end of, of climate change? Because I think sometimes you know, we know that there, there is huge global inequality here and that, you know, we kind of do all of this stuff in, in very developed countries that can have an impact kind of elsewhere um, around the planet who are who are very low contributors or you know have a low impact but a high vulnerability and um, but I think sometimes it's useful just to see some of those impacts locally and to kind of see what's actually already happening on our doorstep have you got any kind of examples there that you could share um this does seem counterintuitive I mentioned them before but Coronation Street what the hell has, has Coronation Street got to do with all this love um it's <laughs> it's uh, they were the first to go carbon literate, driven by a few members of, of the team there. And alongside uh, that, 
uh, they look long and hard at their processes. Now, the typical thing for, for a film or TV studio, you, you ship in your props, your, your, your scenery, uh, or the kit you need to, to do that. Um, I think they went over to green energy pretty rapidly, um, but they've pretty much got a closed loop production facility over in Trafford. It's officially Trafford might be media city but it's actually across the water it's in trafford um they would have they would have me say but um if you ever got the opportunity to have a a look behind the scenes there ask to see the prop store they recycle props they've got props going back 60 years you know i'm not a fan but my goodness wow it that was, was definitely it, going to it, be an elevate tour once we're allowed it, out and about again we're no, going to make that happen marvelous. and they they've just embedded it into what they do um you know the, so it's when they're just making any purchase or decision you know well you know this is part of their criteria um so much so itv studios the bit of itv you know fully commercial uh company um they've just uh, so 2030 net zero target and in as part of the launch of that uh, I'd highly recommend you googling catastrophe street they've done the opening titles of the uh, climate gone wrong version of uh, their amazing program uh, and they've done oh yeah this morning's turned into this warming and there's something equally corny about Anton Deck as well I, I will uh, find the link and drop it you, in the no, comments must, on this video they're, they're really um, uh, thought provoking. So um, they're doing it they're, they're, you know, and simple stuff like um, when uh, people go on set, it, you, you just used to grab your, your bottle of plastic water. No, you get given uh, a durable uh, water bottle with your name on it and it stays with you. Um, you know, so there's some really simple stuff like that that you can do as well. And it's just part of their, their culture. And it's also part of their recruiting now. So a desirable attribute for any job at ITV Studios, carbon literacy. So, you know, they're making sure that they're trying to attract that sort of person into the organization too. And like when we've spoken, haven't we, we've kind of looked at it almost at the other side of being a, you know, where there's there's a skills shortage that an employer will bring something like this in to attract the best talent. We then obviously have areas such as TV production and, and getting involved in that side of things where it's where it's incredibly competitive to get through the door that it's it's kind of nice to see on the other side a company being like, well, we're doing this and we've got our pick of people that want to come and work with us. We can start to, to influence that at a real kind of cultural level coming in. So I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. So the title of this was kind of, can we get to net zero? And we've obviously covered off huge amounts of, of what that means, different things that we can do. I appreciate that we have kind of different targets for net zero for, for organisations, for the region and a kind of a, a, a national level. So I suppose my question to you is being based here in Greater Manchester with the net zero target of 2038, can we actually do that? Okay, um, I sit on a, a body of the combined the Greater Manchester Combined Authority called the Green City uh, Partnership Board or some such. Um, and so we were party very much to this 2038 carbon neutrality target. The best minds, as you can imagine, were, were brought to the table. Uh, A, to define the target and University of Manchester Tyndall Centre came up with 2038 to make our equitable um, our equitable contribution to the Paris Climate Agreement, uh, 2038 was it. And they and uh, the consultants uh, and thesis uh, came together to look at how we would get there. And I'll never forget this graph that had four lines of scenarios uh, uh, from uh, business as usual to really, really flip it difficult. Yeah, scenario four, um, where we pull all the levers and really pull out. Uh, and you had the point of zero at 2038 down the horizontal axis. And we didn't get there, not by even scenario four. We got very close, but there was a gap at the end where we literally don't know how we're going to do that last bit. Um, and actually, I think it was Steve Connor from Creative Concern went, uh, well, that's what we do here in Manchester, isn't it? 
look at a look at a gap like that and we fill it it's called innovation isn't it i'm paraphrasing but you get the spirit <laughs> i um, can hear him saying it <laughs> <laughs> Good. um so uh, we have a gap we don't know how it, it's like starting on a necessary uh, journey with a bit of fogginess at the destination about exactly how you get through the door at the end. The imperative is to act large, act fast. Um, there might be some big bills to, to get that going, but uh, it's going to be cheaper than inaction because of the cost of the disruption from extreme weather. Um, and we're going in five year chunks yeah, to get to the 2038. And so what are we midway through the first five year plan? Um, and so can we? Um, yeah, because by the time we get to that last five year plan, we'll have better ideas in train. We're already exceeding our estimates on uh, electric vehicle use and the targets for that, for example, just as one element of it, I think we're gonna to have to be much more ambitious on retrofitting properties uh, for low carbon, for energy efficiency. It's gonna go at quite a scale in the domestic sector, in housing. Um, uh, I think the biggest gap we're identifying is around commercial uh, property, which given our hosts is very relevant. Um, I, I, know, I know there's a real will uh, particularly from Bromwood and, and others uh, in the sector to get this done. But if you're a tenant, a Bromwood tenant, say, can we do more on this? I think they need to feel that there's a uh, customer demand to get that going. Those are some of the gaps. Um, I'm so glad you said yes in that because I was going to be upset if you hadn't um, and I think that's probably um, where we'll kind of start to to wrap up for the day and I think it's just a couple of things that that were worth kind of um, drawing out for, from that kind of answer is it is that kind of very you know Manchester feel of you know it's okay like we will fill that and I've heard it referred to it a few times as as the innovation gap there that it's just because we don't know how doesn't mean we won't get there and I think it's also so important to be like getting close to it is better than not doing it at all so actually like let's crack on and do all the stuff that that we know we can do and make some massive impact and at the same time have all those you know wonderful brilliant people that we have you know innovating and working on new solutions so that as we get closer that innovation gap kind of starts to to shrink down a little bit and as we mentioned previously you know filling that innovation gap that's where the really exciting stuff happens around job creation and, and kind of bringing new skills and investment into the area, which is, is obviously absolutely critical. And yet our, our host Bruntwood Works, you know, and Bruntwood SciTech for that matter, you know, hugely passionate about sustainability and doing an enormous amount of work. And I know they're they're so keen to have those conversations with their customers all of the time because they know they need the customers on the journey with them and it's as much as it's about you know in, in any scenario it's that that bottom much approach from customers being like this is what we want from our landlord this is what we want to do it's also you know for for Bruntwood as a group to be able to have the impact they want it's being able to engage the conversation the other way it doesn't kind of just sit with one or the other where where it's really going to work is is when we can bring all of those people together so thanks ever so much for joining us today Phil um we will I'm no doubt be catching up again soon i'm super excited about um the work that we've got planned um to do together over kind of you know the next year or so at least we are running um a full day's carbon literacy training tomorrow which um is funded and supported through the business growth hub and bays um really excited to get some some new businesses through that program we've got proposals out for people to become the world's first carbon literate law firm world's first carbon literate um, recruitment agency and it's just so exciting when we talk to people that there is a, a real appetite not just for getting the tick box but for kind of doing all the work and um, that sits behind it so absolute credit to you and your team for for what you've been able to create and, and get all of that that impact um that we're seeing around us 
the next one in the series of these lunch and learn seminars um, with Bruntwood Works is going to be around the future of the workplace. I have absolutely no doubt that sustainability is going to pop up on that agenda as well as, as one of the things that we're looking at. Uh, we'll also obviously be talking about the changing space off the back of the pandemic, how um, landlords and businesses are starting to plan going forward um, this year and beyond. Um, we will have a guest speaker from Bruntwood Works who I'm sure will be more than keen to talk to about some of the pioneer buildings that are going on. Um, I personally cannot wait um, for lockdown to be lifted and, and go back in and work from those spaces, you know, beautiful places and enabling that kind of collaboration that we miss. I cannot wait to be able to deliver training sessions um, in person there as well as doing them online. So huge thanks to Phil, huge thanks to, to Bruntwood Works um, and to all of you for joining. Uh, if you do have any questions off the back of this, please do feel free um, to drop me a message it's elona at elevategm.com or drop us a tweet at elevategm and let us know what you thought um, and if you've got any questions I'm sure we will be picking up this topic again soon thanks ever so much everybody